Good afternoon. I'm proud of all of you for getting the time change for this event, correct? If you had it in your minds, it had been being 2.30 and we switched it to 2 and you got it. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. This, um, this is proving to be um, a fun thing that we do when we get together to have people tell a story and um, Beth's going to say a little bit more about it later, but we still want you to be thinking about what your story is that you want to tell. But we have five great storytellers today. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from each of them, and we're so glad that all of you are here. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started so as not to take up their time. And our first storyteller today is Albert Myberg, who lives in Valley Apartments. Um, he and his wife, Virginia, moved here in 2005, and Virginia died a couple of years ago. Um, but he's going to come now and tell um, two propositions, I think is the name of it. Proposal. Do what? Two proposals. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> Make sure the microphone's set Thank right you. for you. Great. Yeah. Is that a good level, you think? Yeah. Thank you. Well, the title of my story is Two Propositions. <laughs> that's not prep prop prepositions, that's propositions. I'm going to pull this up a little closer. Is that, may yeah, I do that? Yeah, yeah sure. We want to be sure everybody can right, hear you. Right. Thank you. All right. We learned about, by we I mean my wife and I learned about Springmore through a neighbor in Wake Forest. Sarah Pearson lived around the corner. She was an outgoing, retired social worker. I was teaching a seminary course on ministry with older persons, and we were considering the topic housing alternatives in later life. I knew that Sarah was planning to come to Springmore, so I called her up one night about 10 o'clock in the evening. Sarah, I said, is it too late for me to come over to your house for about five minutes? I have a proposition I want to make to you. <laughs> Albert, she said, you know I never go to bed till 12 o'clock, come ahead. She readily agreed to talk to the class and tell why she was considering Spring Moore. She was the daughter of Dr. Cullum, a religion professor at Wake Forest College, and had grown up on North Main Street. After she married Skinny Pearson, also a college professor, they had built a house on College Street about a block away from the home that she grew up in. All of her life had been lived in these two houses. She had one married daughter living in Raleigh whose husband was not well, and she did not want to become a burden to her daughter. She charmed the class as she explained her reasons for applying to Springmore and what she hoped for as a result. Not long after she moved to Springmore, she met a friend whose husband had also been a college teacher. On Halloween, they got out their husband's black academic robes, put on peaked hats, and went door to door calling out, trick or treat. <laughs> Sarah had been a widow for 25 years. She told my wife, Virginia, that she did not realize how lonely she had been until she came to Springmore. After she had settled in, she called and invited Virginia and me to be her dinner guests, which was our first visit to Springmore. When we approached the front entrance, she greeted us at the door by exclaiming, Albert, I have a proposition I want to make to you. <laughs> Will you marry Buster and me? <laughs> Pointing to a gentleman close by. She explained that they had met on the bus to the doctor's office. <laughs> they began taking walks after dinner. 
and one thing led to another. Not long afterward, Virginia was shopping at Belk's in Crabtree when she ran into Sarah. I need help, Sarah said. I'm buying my trousseau and I don't even know where the lingerie department is. <laughs> Virginia guided her to her desired destination and they had fun together. I don't know for certain whether this was the first time that two Springmore residents married each other, but it certainly was early in Springmore's history. I conducted the wedding ceremony in the little chapel, so attendance was limited, but I think every resident was present at the reception that followed in the great room. Thank you. I think, I'm not sure if that was the first wedding or the second wedding. I meant to check out those statistics, but I think it probably was the first one. Um, coming next is Suggy Styers, who is a relatively new resident. When did you move here, Suggy? June. June, okay. And she lives in East Apartments. Come on. I want to get this microphone so everybody can hear you. Please, Terry. I'll try to stop by you and be loud. Yeah, get, it, get it so you're eating it. I'll try to eat the microphone so you can hear me. <laughs> can you hear me okay? My story is very different. I grew up in Greenville, North Carolina. And if you're from eastern North Carolina, you know it's as flat as the palm of your hand and you could see forever if it wasn't for the pine trees at the end of the fields. I'm a nurse and my professional life was spent in Caldwell County, which is west of here. Uh, I might also mention that I was prone to motion sickness. <laughs> Caldwell County um, is fairly flat and rolling as you go in and they grow bright leaf tobacco, so I felt at home with bright leaf tobacco. But then, after you get to Lenore, the county seat, and most of the population is from Lenore East, it gets pretty rough. I mean, you're going in back roads, almost all of them are dirt, red clay. And my two, and my two cousins, all right, and you're going up, up, up. The Blowing Rock is in Caldwell County. And there's a mountain that's just taller than Grandfather Mountain called Callaway Peak. And Caldwell County goes right up to the peak on Callaway Peak. So it gets pretty rough back there. The people are wonderful. There's a, a lot of Baptists. In the Saturday night paper, there would be listings of 120 Baptist churches that were having service on Monday. On Sunday morning. There was a lot of Appalachian flavor there. Very Appalachian. And I had to get used to the language. Um, and some of the things that I had to get used to is people put their groceries in pokes, not in bags. And they drank dopes instead of Cokes or soft drinks or sodas. They had no idea what nabs were or crackers. They said things like not and bright and far, which was fire, and har, which was hair. Um, and this all came from the Elizabethan language. So, you know, the Appalachian people got left on the mountains and everybody else went over all the way to California. But wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm going to tell you a few things that happened to me. The first thing I'm going to tell you about is, and think if you were fast asleep and the phone rang at five minutes past 1 a.m. and the lady said, Miss Dyers, I've got a rifle to my head and I'm going to pull the trigger. What do you do? Well, my first impulse was, hang up and get out there. But if I hung up, she's going to shoot herself. Oh, I'll call the sheriff and have them go out there. Well, I can't hang up because I can't call the sheriff. And she'll kill herself. Finally, talked for a long, long time. This lady was very upset. 
Her husband was younger. Um, to be real honest, he was sorry. But don't ever say that I said that. Um, and he was running around big time. And she was just, she had it. Finally talked her into waking her daughter, who took the rifle away, and things calmed down. A few years later, she shot that sorry so-and-so, and she's still in jail. <laughs> Another time I went in to a home to take care of an older lady about our age. And after I had finished with her, her 50-some-year-old daughter said to me, would you, I've got some important papers here, would you um, witness my, uh, my mark? And I said, no ma'am, I will not, but I'll teach you how to write your name. So we sat down and she said, I can't do it, I can't do it. But in a, just a short while, she was doing it and she signed her own papers and I witnessed her signature. So I had some fun things that happened. There was a lady called, uh, I call her Carrie, and we'll call her Carrie Fox. At that time, anybody who was discharged from Broughton, and this is Broughton Hospital in Morganton, not Broughton High School, um, was referred through the public health nurses who made visits monitored their medicines, reported back to the hospital how they were getting along. And she had been very depressed and was doing well. And we would um, do all my work and then we'd go out and we'd walk in the yard and she'd show me her yard because she lived way out, way out. Her husband worked and she was there by herself most of the time. So she needed some company and she happened to learn that I had a a new house and we were landscaping and I wanted a sugar maple and you know how beautiful they are. She said, well I have some right out here in the woods and I said, no ma'am, I can't do that. She said, oh yes you can. And we took a shovel and we went out and dug up a sapling. I was driving a little Volkswagen convertible and we took the top down and put the tree in. Um, I've got two ends of this story. One was as I was leaving I was coming around a, a very narrow dirt road, coming around this curb, and there was a black snake. And he was, I said six feet, but he went from one side of that little dirt road to the other side. I could not stop, and I rode over him, and I looked back. He was gone, I couldn't find him. And I just knew he was under my little car, and he was gonna come up and visit me in a few minutes. But I got home, the tree was planted. Carrie Fox took all of her medicine about a year later, went up in the attic, lay down on a cot, and died. But the tree is still beautiful. I don't live there anymore, as you know. But it's a big, strong tree. In the fall, it is magnificent. And I call it the Carrie Fox tree. Another, th Another thing that I did was, um, I went to a still one time. I had been visiting this family and I figured they were bootlegging or at least making it. I don't know who was bootlegging it. Because you know how these little old wooden houses out in the country are and you look through the front door and you can see right out the back door? We've all seen them. Well, in their backyard they had some fairly big bushes and they had bottles stuck all over those bushes drying. So I knew they were doing something, but you know, that's not public health nurse business, so I would take care of my business. And one day I went in and they were really upset and they were in big trouble because the revenue men had been there the night before and raided their steel. So it was late in the afternoon. I drove to the office, checked in, and went home, got my children, took them back out to the steel. And the revenue man showed us around and showed us what a steel was like and how the liquor was made. It was fun, it was really interesting. Um, there was a meal there that went round in circles. That I think he was crushing whatever they made the, you know, had to ferment. That night somebody stole the meal and I am sure that my family was back in the business very quickly. <laughs>
another time, um, I was working with a, a family. The young man um, was in his late 20s and he had an incurable brain tumor and he was going to die, no doubt about that. But while I was there, I got to meet his three-year-old and his three-year-old had allergies like you would not believe. Drippy nose, runny eyes, wasn't hearing well. Um, his pediatrician wanted him to be seen by a pediatric allergist. Well, have you ever found a pediatric allergist in the mountains of North Carolina? <laughs> they don't exist. But I was in Charlotte, and so I went to see a Dr. McKay, uh, who was a pediatric allergist, and I said, can I pay you for him, the child? I think I can arrange transportation. There's no way I can pay your fees. And if you want the child to have allergy vaccine, I haven't got any way to pay you for that. And he said, I will see and follow the child and I will furnish the vaccine if that's the plan we take. His father, little boy's father died. I closed the case. And about a year later, I was in that area and I thought, I better check on that family. So I went and when he saw me at the door, he came running and he said, listen, Miss Towers, I can hear my feet stopping and I can hear the birds singing. <laughs> So that's the kind of life I lived. I could tell you more and more. Um, funny things, I got reported to the White House. Um, many, many more things that are so part of my life. And the name of my program was, I can't believe I did it. That wasn't really right. I thank God I had the opportunity. Suggy, thank you. Our third storyteller is Charles Elks. He lives in East Apartments and he and Selma moved here in February of 2009. His wife Selma uh, died some months back and we're, we're sorry she can't be here, but she's with us in spirit, isn't she, Charles? Charles, will you come now? I expect some of you have heard this story before, <clears throat> but uh, I don't know if tell it the same way twice, so maybe you, may, you might not even recognize it. <laughs> uh, this story takes place on April the 26th, 2006. This was a Saturday afternoon. My wife and I had been out to lunch, and on our way back, about a mile from our townhome, there were two or three more townhomes that were being shown, and we decided to stop and look at one of them. And when we came out, we were going to go look at some more, but I looked over in the west and there was a terrible looking cloud over there. And I told her, I said, we better get home. So we made it home and uh, we were in the living room. And let me say that these homes were four, four residents in each, in each building. Or each building had four homes in it. And they were separated by double garages. So, uh, but, but we, we made it home and I was sitting in the living room in my easy chair watching Channel 5 chart the storm. If they'd have called me, I could have told them where it was. But uh, in, uh, my wife, Zelma, was standing about three feet in front of me, close to the coffee table. And this was a fairly large room and we, I was about 14 feet from the fireplace. Uh, a neighbor had told me he was standing at his window watching the storm and said he had seen a ball of fire headed right from my chimney. I had heard of lightning in streaks, but I'd never heard of ball of lightning before. Well, that, that ball of lightning came down the chimney and came out of the fireplace. And when it came out of the fireplace, it was a ball of fire just about big as my head. And it exploded. And when it exploded, it dissipated, thanks goodness. And it was the loudest noise you can, you just can't imagine how loud it was. I had a carbon monoxide detector plugged in the receptacle beside the fireplace. It blew it out of the wall and shredded it into pieces as it came flying by me. And I told them, I says, in all probability the house is on fire, but I'm not going out there that crashing lightning to see. 
And uh, this particular room had a vaulted ceiling in it. And about a couple of minutes later, I looked up in the ceiling and the flames were just pouring out the heat ducts. And I says, we have to get out of here now. And the gentleman says, I got to get my pocketbook. She ran back in the bedroom <laughs> to get her pocketbook, which was a good idea. And uh, we went out through the kitchen into the double garage. Uh, and incidentally, of course, the, the lightning had fried everything electrically in the whole place. And uh, I had just had my right shoulder joint replaced six weeks before. Won't supposed to lift anything other than a bit larger than a pound. And I had to find a stepladder to get on top so I could reach the chain to pull the chain to release the garage door opener. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. And we got the two cars out and went across the street, of course, to try to get out of harm's way. Uh, but in the meantime, I did run to all the other three families and alert them that that building was on fire. Fortunately, the fire department wasn't about nine-tenths of a mile away, and they were there in short order. And I think all the neighbors, each one of them must have called them, because we had six fire trucks out there <laughs> and two EMS trucks. Uh, the fire, uh, the, 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 the furnace was in the attic, and of course the gas line was up there, and the lightning ruptured the gas line, and the gas line was feeding the fire. So the, roof, the flames were coming out the top of the house 15, 20 feet high. And uh, so we, but after a few minutes, the fire department got to the meter and cut the gas off, and that relieved some of that problem. But uh, as we stood there and watched it, uh, you can't imagine how we felt. It was a very empty feeling. Plus, we were scared to death, and we also, oh, we were dead death because we couldn't hear from that loud explosion. But uh, one of the EMS ladies took my blood pressure, and it was 210 over 100. And, but it calmed down for two or three hours. I later asked my family and doctor, should I take a stress test? He said, no, you've already had one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as we stood there and watched it burn, I called a couple of friends of mine, that were one of them in particular was a civil, arrested civil engineer, and the guy had been in construction business for about 40 years. And he and his wife came over and stood there with us. And he finally looked at me and he says, do you want me to help you with this? I said, what do you think I called you for? <laughs> but uh, it, it burned for two and a half hours. And it was quite a fire. But uh, later on, the, he, well, that evening, I finally called the uh, insurance company, and they had a, a, an adjuster on, on the site the next morning. Uh, about 10 o'clock and of course this, my friend, the civil engineer, met him and st stayed with him uh, and to begin to working on it. The adjuster and the insurance company were very good to us. He looked at Zelma and I and he says, I don't want you to touch a thing, to do anything, we will take care of everything. And by Tuesday of that week, they had us a credit card losing $5,000. He said, if you need to spend anything, spend this. So I was overwhelmed. I had never heard of an insurance company being that kind to you. But uh, we spent uh, the next week, of course, trying to find a place to live. As far as loss is concerned, uh, we lost the bedroom suit in, in our bedroom, and it was a solid mahogany suit that belonged to my mother and daddy. It was about 80 years old. Uh, we lost all the furniture in the living room and the kitchen. When the firemen got there, they closed the big double doors that I had going to a large uh, guest bedroom where I had my office and, and other things. And then they also closed the doors off to the sun porch. So we were able to save some of the furniture in the guest bedroom and some on the sun porch. But everything else was trashed. But fortunately, uh, I had taken pictures of every piece of that furniture and had it in my lockbox. And as I say, the adjusters were very good to us. The only difference we split was on the value of that bedroom suit. I fortunately was able to take the pictures to some furniture companies, and of course you couldn't buy mahogany furniture anymore. And they said, well, it's worth between seven and twelve thousand dollars. 
and he wanted to price a bedroom suit about five, but I finally got him up to nine and we settled. But uh, it was a about a $300,000 fire. Uh, we were able to rent an apartment just up the hill and there were some luxury apartments up there, uh, so we didn't have to change our dress. We could walk down and get our mail and so forth in that day. But uh, it was it was a very scary experience uh, to say we were in shock, but we also were thankful to be alive because it was about as close to death as I think I've ever been. But I'll have to say one thing, I am now allergic to lightning. <laughs> I've never heard of being allergic to lightning, but I think if anybody could be, uh, Charles, you would have reason to be. Um, thank you for your story. Our next storyteller is, uh, is a very new resident here at Springmore. Alan Woods and his wife Libby have moved into Creedmoor Apartments. They moved there in August. So just, have you been here a month? Yesterday. Yes, a month yesterday, okay, all right. They came to our storytelling event last month and Alan indicated that he had some tales he would like to tell. So he is coming to talk about some of his experiences. Alan, would you come? You need any help adjusting that? Well, we'll see. I think maybe it's right. Okay. During rehearsal um, last week, Phyllis Beth and the co-speakers told me I talked too long and I ought to cut my speech in half, so I did. So this is the first installment. You'll have to come back some other time to hear the end of it. In September of 1942, I was beginning my junior year in a high school in a little farming community in Farragut, Iowa. I lived with a congregational minister and his wife working for my board and room, and the war came along, and Reverend Phil enlisted in the Army, and I thought the Navy's the place for me, and so I enlisted in the Navy, and, and at age 17, my dad had to sign for me, and he did, and off I went to the Great Lakes Naval Training Station in Chicago. Um, I, was, I, I was in the class, they called them a class, for a four-week period we were a test group and during those four weeks we had shots and more shots and chow line and lectures and those terrible movies of unprotected sex that they showed us trying to protect we innocent kids. <laughs> on, a, on a cold morning in, in about January, I think it was, we were lined up outside the barracks and this boatswain mate said, you, you, and you are going to cooking school. So I was one of those yous. So they sent me back to Iowa, to Ames College, Iowa State College, to go to Cook and Baker School. And I'll tell you, those women in Iowa really made us work. We were there for 16 weeks. They wanted to be sure that we knew how to feed their boys in uniform. And the sorority girls, wanted to be sure that we Navy boys knew how to party. <laughs> and after 16 weeks of intensive instruction, I was shipped to Treasure Island in San Francisco. And as the jeep that was carrying another sailor and myself pulled up alongside that ship, I wondered why I had ever joined the Navy. <laughs> I'd never seen a ship, and the most water I'd ever seen was in the horse tank on the farm. <laughs> but there I was, and we went aboard, 
And I thought, now I'm a sailor. Until we started to go to sea and the ship went out under the Golden Gate Bridge, the water was so rough, I became so seasick, I thought I would die. Then I hoped I would die. <laughs> and I crawled in my bunk, which was four, four bunks up on the top, and I stayed there all day and all night, except when I would jump down and run up on deck to feed the fishes. <laughs> the next morning the boatswain mate came along and he grabbed me by the hair and he shook me and he said, mate, you're on duty. Get your fanny up to the galley. Now he didn't use the word fanny, but since you <laughs> And I did. And you know, I never got seasick again. So off we go to the South Pacific. I soon became acclimated to the ship's routine, getting up at 4 a.m. to make coffee in the 60-gallon steam-jacketed kettles. Um, now you can imagine what a, how large, if you've never been in a big kitchen, 60 gallon steam jacketed kettles, you know, I had to have a stool to get on in order to stir anything or to clean the pots. But we had 60 gallon steam jacketed kettles and we made coffee in it. In those days we did not have bags for coffee. We heated the water, put the coffee grounds in, when we thought the coffee was strong enough, we broke a couple eggs in the top, and the eggs would settle to the bottom and take the coffee grounds down. And you had pretty good coffee. It's all I had, so they drank it. Um, but later, later in the war, they provided us with bags to make coffee. These big kettles were used for everything. You know, you heard of Navy beans, well, we, I probably have baked more beans than all of you together have seen in your life. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of pounds of beans we were baking. Always on Saturday morning we had baked beans, always, because that was the day of inspection. So we didn't, we, we didn't have to do any cooking for breakfast because the beans were in the pot and when the captain came through everything was clean. We also used these kettles to dye the uniforms, the white uniforms of the crew that worked on deck. Now remember we were in the South Pacific and the Japanese were there. And the theory was that the uniforms would reflect the sun back over the horizon, which would tell the Japanese where our ship was. So we used our coffee pots <laughs> and dyed the uniforms. I don't know whether it worked or not, but orders are orders, and so we died them. The Monargo was a troop transport. It had 2,100 soldiers aboard, and we fed them three meals a day. So the galley operated around the clock, 24-7. We had fresh eggs when we started out from Frisco and, and fresh milk. But as soon as that ran out, of course, we opened the big barrels that you were sure the cow was already in there because that milk smelled, but we made used powdered milk and powdered eggs. We did not have instant potatoes yet. Our bake shop baked bread and cakes and cookies day and night. For entertainment, the bakers used to break, take a loaf of bread and break it apart, cut slices, and then they'd each take a slice, and then they would bet on who got the most weevils in their slice of bread. <laughs> we stopped in Honolulu and discharged our troops and took on more and sailed on to New Caledonia, the Hybrides Islands, crossed the equator and the international dateline. And it was on this trip that I went through the initiation and advanced from a polywog to a shellback but you'll have to come back to hear that story. <laughs> my, my battle station was manning the depth charges. Now these lethal things look like an innocent oil barrel mounted on a cradle. It 
this is just about what it looked like. And when you pulled the lanyard, the barrel would go up over and out into the ocean and hopefully hit the target and explode. And one day, we were ordered to our battle station. We all knew we had a submarine to get. I was ordered to fire. I fired the depth charge. It went out and hit the target. Ah, were we surprised? We hit a whale. There wasn't a submarine. <laughs> didn't, get a, didn't get a star for that one. While anchored in Samoa, Admiral Nimitz, commander of the South Pacific Fleet, came aboard and ordered us back to the States. He said the converted cruise ship uh, was not, with the wooden decks was not battle-worthy. So no one minded leaving these romantic islands. We were going home. At least we were going back to the States. Arriving in Frisco, we were ordered to take the ship down through the canal and up to New York for decommissioning. While anchored in Guantanamo Bay for R&R, the captain ordered all excess supplies to be o thrown overboard. He didn't want to have to inventory him when, when we decommissioned. Oh, I forgot to tell you, while in San Francisco as a ship's cook third class, I was in charge of ordering supplies. I went through the Navy cookbook and I saw that they use lots of bay leaves, so I ordered 10 pounds of bay leaves. Now this is, this is a couple of ounces of bay leaves. And you can imagine how many bags, gunny sacks full of bay leaves came aboard. So while we were in Guantanamo Bay, we threw all of the bay leaves into the ocean. And we seasoned all the fish for everybody for many years. We were granted liberty in, in Panama City, and so with a bunch of young sailors, I went on liberty. It was kind of a dark night, and we were walking down the street, and from a dark doorway, I heard somebody going, psst, psst. And so I thought, we walked along, and pretty soon again, I heard, psst, psst. So I went, Psst, back at him. <laughs> Another sailor who was much brighter than me said, hey, you know, Woods, that was the call from the ladies of the night and you just accepted. <laughs> I went a little faster down the street. <laughs> While aboard the Monargo, I studied for and took a test to become a ship's cook second class. Big deal, I got another stripe. Probably got a $25 a month raise. But I also, while I was aboard this ship, now I was just starting as a junior when I, in high school when I went in the service. And the, I signed up with the Army Navy Institute in Madison, Wisconsin for correspondence. And I took correspondent courses all the years that I was in the service. And when I was discharged, I earned enough credits to get my high school diploma from Farragut, Iowa. There, to be continued. <laughs> Well, it looks like we have at least one other storyteller for, a, for another time. Yeah, and Suggy's offered to tell more stories too, haven't you? Have you? <laughs> Our final storyteller today is June Miller. June lives in Creedmoor Apartments and she came to Springmore, it says here in August of 2008, so about four, you've lived here four years, June. All right, would you come and tell your story today? On February the 6th, 1946, I was one of the 2,000 war brides and 700 children 
that sailed on the Queen Mary from Southampton, England, bound for New York. In October of 1942, my future husband Roy arrived in Belfast, Northern Ireland, with a contingent of the 8th Army Air Corps Composite Command. I was born and raised in Belfast. We were introduced a few weeks after his arrival, and we married in June of 1943. The war ended in August 1945, and my husband was sent home to be discharged. I might add that uh, we were one of the first uh, couples to be married, and he had to get permission from his commanding officer, and my family and myself had to be checked out from one end to the other, just to make sure that there was no IRA connection of any kind, because they certainly didn't want to import to the United States someone that could bring problems. And when we were married, his commanding officer was his best man, and uh, the chaplain helped with the uh, wedding ceremony along with my uh, Episcopal Rector. Now, um, I had a great deal of work ahead of me to complete the paperwork which was required by the American Embassy in order to be given a visa to join my husband. Then I received the news to come to Tidworth Camp in the south of England for a week of orientation before sailing on the Queen Mary. This camp had been on the, an army camp, and a small group of the military was there to take care of us, as well as German prisoners of war. They made our beds, hear you still closer. Thank you. swept out the Nissan huts where we were housed, and left the uh, kept the heaters applied with the fuel to keep us warm. We were not happy on seeing those POWs. The war was too fresh in our minds, and to us, the Germans were still the enemy. However, the orientation uh, we got was uh, consisted of being introduced to American food, which was pretty much similar to what we had grown up with. However, we were also introduced to hot dogs, and I have to admit, I was not too keen on a hot dog. It took me a while to acquire a taste to be able to enjoy them. Now, um, we also had to uh, learn about the American money and be acquainted with the American way of life and a physical examination was also required. One of the things they were very uh, fussy about was they wanted to be sure that you did not have tuberculosis and so long x-rays were taken to ensure that uh, you didn't. On February the 6th, 1946, we took the train bound for Southampton and boarded the Queen Mary. My journey had really begun. I was given a cabin to myself as I had a little boy of 22 months and a baby girl of six months. A hammock-like device was attached to my bed for my baby. She loved it. The gentle swaying of the ship enabled her to sleep soundly. We were treated like first-class passengers, and the food was terrific. Having endured six years of rationing, we were very happy to board the Queen. We had English ladies who volunteered to help us who had babies. What a wonderful service they provided. 
I could have my meals in the dining room with my son, knowing that the baby was being well taken care of. The night before we docked in New York, several of the ship's officers entertained us with a variety show. They sang and danced, and it was terrific. I will never forget seeing the Statue of Liberty as we sailed into the harbor. We lined the decks and sang, God bless America. And I still get a little emotional when I think about that. Even though we were 3,000 miles from the homes we had grown up in, we were happy in the knowledge that we would be reunited with our husbands and with our new relatives and prepare ourselves to become American citizens. I am very proud to be one. I am proud that my children grew up here, my grandchildren, and now my great-grandchildren are growing up here. They have given me a dynasty I am very proud of. Thank you. And God bless you all. And now I would like if you would join me in singing God Bless America. I, would, I think that would be wonderful for us to sing that wonderful song together. God Bless America and this to continue. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's great, isn't it? You learn things about people you never knew, or maybe you knew them, but not as fully as you're finding this out about each other. These are your stories, each one unique, each one a gift that you give to the community. We need more people to volunteer to tell a story. The stories you heard today were a one incident, Charles's great adventure with lightning, um, or it was uh, a composite, Suggy's work as a public health nurse. You see, it can take all kinds of forms. So there's not one way to tell your story, but we would like for you to Give some more thought to doing that. On the back of the announcement sheet that Phyllis prepared that you received, we particularly are interested um, for November if you have stories of Thanksgiving or gratitude or family. Uh, for December, we invite Christmas, Hanukkah, winter, New Year's stories. If that comes out, we'll do a theme like that. If not, we'll do something else. We want your stories. So give some thought to what you'd like to tell us. Contact me, Beth Roberts, or contact Phyllis. And thank you very much for coming today. <laughs>